Hey, will you stand with me? We're going to look at some verses today from John 6, verses 47 through 59. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up and follow along. It'll be on the screen as well. Starting in verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I, will, I live because of the Father. And so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to come and examine your word and let it examine us. And so, God, I just pray that um, everything that's spoken in here today is the fullness of your truth and that we are invited into a deeper understanding of what it is you would have us know so that we may live as you would have us live. And I just ask that if, that if anything is not the fullness of your truth, it just falls to the ground and we walk out of this space transformed by your word. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you can have a seat. So we're starting a series today called Say What? And you might have noticed on the lyric slides, but I would bet that all of us at some point or another have had a say what moment when trying to understand some of the teachings of Jesus. Things that on the surface seem a little confusing or even downright baffling. The problem is that I think a lot of times we encounter these teachings that can be kind of hard. We read these statements and we do one of two things. Either we step right over them and move on to the things that make more sense to us, that feel more comfortable to us, or we reshape the teaching, we mold it so that it will fit nicely and neatly into our preconceived ideas and our present understanding. I think we've all done that. And the problem with that is when we make the hard teachings of Jesus a little more palatable for us, we miss out on some incredible things that Jesus would love for us to grasp and to live into. We all do it. We do it with all kinds of information and insights. And it happens any time that the thing that we're learning has value in how we live and how we actually live it out. We don't tend to do this with things that don't matter. It's easy to let those fall by the wayside. If it's not an important thing, we just let it go. We won't try to reshape it to fit our present understanding, and we won't wrestle with it because we know it's not going to change how we live. But if we're apprenticed to Jesus, then everything he says is important to how we live. If we're seeking to be transformed into his image, and, how he, and live how he lived, then we can't dismiss any of his teachings, even the hard ones, even the ones that cause us to pause and ask questions that maybe we don't have answers to. We need to let those teachings shape our understanding and our ideas, not let our understandings and ideas shape his teachings. So in this series, we're going to look at some of the harder teachings of Jesus and try to wrestle with them for both context and understanding, to, to understand the environment he said these things in and to help us understand what exactly it is that we should do with these things so that they will impact how we live 
not just change what we know, because we want to be people who spend time with Jesus, living under his kingdom rule, and doing the things that he did. None of that can happen if we just simply sidestep the difficult teachings of Jesus. This means that in this series, we need to be humble. We need to approach things maybe we've heard many, many times. And we need to be able to say, Lord, there's always a deeper truth with you, so I'll open my heart and my mind and let you teach me. And we need to explore not only some of the hard teachings, but also our preconceived ideas and notions around those teachings. And we need to put those hard teachings in the context that Jesus first spoke them in. Then we need to ask ourselves this question. Now knowing what Jesus meant in this hard teaching, how shall I live? That's the question we need to deal with when we look at the hard teachings of Jesus because if we're not seeking to have the teachings of Jesus change how we live, then all we're really seeking when we try to learn his teachings is to puff ourselves up in spiritual knowledge. If we don't expect to be changed by what he taught, then all we're really doing is trying to find a way to say, look, I have some understanding and it makes me feel good. I have some knowledge and it makes me feel good. And so today, we're gonna look at a teaching of Jesus that caused a bit of a stir among his disciples. And if you've ever read John 6, you know that there was a big reaction to this teaching. And so in John 6, 56, he says this, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And see, it's such a difficult teaching here in verse 56 that in verse 60, it says that his disciples even asked him, who can listen to this? You ever had somebody teach you something or tell you something that was hard and you're like, I'm done, I'm out. I can't hear this. Might have been true, might have been reality, but it wasn't comfortable. And so you just wanted to get away from it. That's what's going on here. To the point that in verse 66, it says this, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. In fact, so many of his disciples left him that day that he felt the need to go ask the 12, his closest friends, if they wanted to leave too. Obviously, what he said here was a super difficult teaching for his disciples, and it's also a difficult teaching for us if we stop and explore it. But it's difficult for different reasons. It was a difficult teaching for his disciples because of their Hebrew context, their understanding as Jewish people what was going on here, their history that brought into the moment all the things that their people had been through when Jesus taught them this. It's a, it's a difficult teaching for us because it's the foundational text of one of the most important ordinances in the church, what we call communion. Many, many faiths, many denominations have different views of communion. And it all comes back to this teaching. And so it makes it difficult for us because it touches on something that we practice on a regular basis that we're actually gonna to practice today. And so this morning, as we look at this teaching, we're gonna do a few things that I think will help you wrestle with this because that's really what we wanna do is we wanna wrestle with these hard teachings, not just accept what I say, but each of us needs to step into those and wrestle with those hard teachings and, and find some deeper meaning in our spiritual life and when we do that, it'll actually sweeten our walk with Jesus. When we just step over the hard teachings, we don't find any deeper life with Christ. We don't find any more sweetness in walking with him. But when we wrestle with it, that community, that union with him becomes sweet and pleasant as we walk with him. And so the first thing I feel like we need to do with this teaching is to hear it, how his Jewish disciples heard it, how they would have heard it in a first century context, which means we need to look at both the immediate context in John's gospel and the cultural context in the history of the Jewish hearers. 
Next thing, I think it'd be helpful for us to see how Jesus connects the concept he's teaching in John 6 in this passage with communion that he institutes at the Last Supper with his apostles. And when we see that connection, we'll understand how this teaching actually grows of people who belong to Christ, who are identified with Christ, who are being shaped by Christ, and are becoming like Christ. And so the next thing, the last thing I want to do when we look at this is I want to look at five important aspects of communion before we take it together today as a spiritual practice. My hope is that by the time we get to that point in our service where we're going to take communion together, it's different. You have a deeper understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So let's start with a little background and overview of the context of this hard teaching. The hard teaching is simple enough. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's the point where people had an issue in what Jesus was saying here. And I want to point out too that he was saying this in a synagogue. So understand, he was on the home turf of his people who had preconceived ideas and notions over what their history had taught them, what their scripture had taught them when he said this. And so this, the immediate context of this teaching is right after he's fed 5,000 people. At the beginning of chapter chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Then the very next day, the same crowds he fed are following after him. And apparently, they're seeking another feeding miracle. Because in verse 26, Jesus says, you're not seeking me because you saw a sign that I was a Messiah, but because you were filled with bread. So it's the same people following after Jesus who he just fed the day before. Then he tells them that the Son of Man will give them food that produces eternal life for them. So in the immediate context of this hard teaching is that the people are focused on their bellies and on the things of this world, on spectacular signs and things that will be scintillating to them, not on eternal things. They're not focused on salvation. They're not thinking about redemption. They're not thinking about eternal life in the kingdom of God. They're seeking Jesus saying, we have physical needs. You met him yesterday. Why don't you do it again? And that's the immediate context for his Jewish hearers. You filled us. Now make yourself, and you made yourself a curiosity to us by filling us yesterday. So why not do it again? Because we all want to see something spectacular, right? We all want to see something that, that seems miraculous to us. But then the next thing we have to understand, that's the immediate context. Next thing we have to understand is the historical context of his Jewish hearers. And we see that in verse 31, when the people basically say, look, Here's the deal. Moses proved he was a prophet from God by giving our ancestors the sign of manna, bread from heaven in the wilderness when they left Egypt. What sign are you going to give us to prove you are the Son of Man, the Messiah? Jesus then tries to get them to see that the manna was actually from God. It was never from Moses, and that's going to be important here in a second. It's a huge issue to recognize that the manna came from God and not from Moses because it impacts their worship at this point in their history. Because in the practice, in practice, in the practicalities, their worship was more about Moses' law at this point than it was about Yahweh's presence. So Jesus is trying to recalibrate their historical context and telling them, you got it wrong. Moses didn't give you this bread. God did. But you you recall when you read the Gospels, at this point, the most important thing to the Jewish people in their faith was the law of Moses. And the manna was always a sign pointing to the greater bread from heaven that was to come through God's covenant with the Jewish people, Jesus himself. But you won't see the bread from heaven as the Messiah if you think Moses is the one who gave you the bread. That's why Jesus is trying to refocus and reorient their understanding here. God's son is given as the bread of eternal life. 
So then in verse 34, we see that they're still thinking in worldly terms when they say, give us this bread always. So they still think that it's about their bellies being full. They still think it's about them being satisfied. They have their immediate context, which is the, the, the being miraculously fed the day before. They have their historical context, their ancestors being fed in the wilderness leaving Egypt. Now he's going to shift it to a spiritual context in verse 35. When he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. See, Jesus has moved it to the spiritual context by telling them plainly that he is the bread of life. And here's why. When you look at this verse in the Greek, the word for life that's used there by Jesus is the word zoe. That means spiritual life. The Greeks had different words for life. The word Jesus used here is not the word for physical life, bios. It's the word zoe that means spiritual existence, spiritual life. And so this is exactly where it becomes a hard teaching for his hearers, for his Jewish audience. Here's why. Because if he would have used the word bios, it would have been way easier for them to hear. If he had used the word bios, they could reject this teaching without question. They would have understood it fully and been able to reject it. And here's why. Because the assumption that many of them made was that Jesus is suggesting cannibalism. The assumption that many of them made was that Jesus is saying, you have to literally, physically eat my flesh if you are going to live forever. And that would have been implied or even suggested if he would have used the word bios for life here. But he didn't. He used the word zoe. And it was easy for a Jew to reject cannibalism. It's easy for us to reject that. If he would have said bios, they could have easily dismissed him as insane or even worse. But because he said zoe, they can't. They can't. Because he made it abundantly clear. He's talking about spiritual life. He's not talking about physical life. Because their spiritual life came through the law of Moses at this point in their minds, not through the grace and mercy of God himself in the son given for us Jesus, then their Messiah was going to conquer all and rule with the law of Moses. That was their expectation. The Jewish Messiah will come. He will drive all of our oppressors out of our country and he will lay down the law of Moses and everybody will live under it. That's not where Jesus is going here, which creates confusion for them because they had preconceived ideas and notions and he blew them all out of the water by using the word zoe instead of bios. And that's why many of them left. Now think about that in our context. How many people do you know who have left walking with Jesus because he didn't meet their expectations? How many people do you know who wanted a Christ who would conquer their present physical circumstances and they got one who said, no, I wanna give you eternal life, spiritual life, and when they got that, they said, I'm done, I'm out. I don't want eternal life in this place, in this kingdom of God. Now, what I need, Lord, is lottery numbers. And you're not giving them to me, so I'm done. What I need is a better job, and you're not giving it to me, so I'm done. What I need is for the doctor to say it was a misdiagnosis, so I'm done. And we walk away. That's exactly what's happening here. These followers of Jesus, when he said, hey, I'm going to tell you a secret. I am here for you to be saved and alive spiritually forever in God's kingdom, ruled by his principles. And they said, well, that's not what we signed up for. We signed up for the law of Moses, where everybody would obey this law. And when I obey that law and I do it well, then people think better of me in this world. And so they left. See, the context that Jesus is teaching them in means that his teaching doesn't fit with their cultural and religious expectations. 
So they left. Don't think for one minute that that stopped happening in the first century. It happens today. It happens often. And oftentimes we do it ourselves. I can look back at moments in my life where I could say, Lord, I am done because you are not meeting my expectations. And I had to struggle and battle through that. It's not a bad thing to face that fight, but it is a bad thing to give up on that fight. We all have moments where we stand before him and say, look, I need more bios impact, not Zoe impact. And if you're not gonna give me the bios impact, there's a good possibility I'm gonna leave. We need to wrestle through that in the context of who he is. But see, here's the thing. Because he said in their cultural and spiritual context, because he said the word Zoe, it left them stuck in a place where they couldn't automatically dismiss what he's teaching here, but they also couldn't automatically accept it. And so they did what many of us do when we face teachings that we can't readily embrace or dismiss. And they just go, well, I'm going to make it a non-issue. I'm going to make it a non-issue and I'll walk away. That's where we're at culturally. When we present Jesus to the lost and they can't readily accept him or dismiss him, they just walk away. But you know what people can't walk away from? Christ in you as a lifestyle. People can't reject that, they can't walk away. When you are living in relationships as someone who is loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled, they cannot ignore it and they can't walk away. So what we see in their response in verse 52 is basically them asking, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They weren't asking if it was okay to eat his actual flesh as nourishment for their physical bodies or their bios because he'd already made it clear that his flesh was nourishment for their spiritual lives, their souls, their zoe. We even see that the 12 apostles themselves were confused by this. When Jesus goes to them in verse 67 and says, hey, what's the deal, guys? Do you want to leave too? And then Peter answers, why would we leave? Why would we leave? But notice, he didn't say why would we leave because we get exactly what you're saying. We understand fully what you're teaching. That's not what Peter said. Peter's answer was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Listen, this is important, and it will connect this teaching in John 6 to the institution of the ordinance of communion in Luke. Peter said, we have enough history with you. We have come to know who you are and we believe who you are and no one else has the words of life, so where would we go? When Peter says that, he's saying, Lord, we remember that we know you. Even in the middle of this hard teaching that we don't understand, we know that we know you. So we know that there is no place else to go. The connection to communion is in the remembering of the person of Jesus in the deep, intimate relationship that we have with him. That's what's happening here for the apostles. That's why they didn't walk away. That's what kept them following him. Not their perfect and clear understanding of what he's saying. I think this is why Jesus tells us to observe communion in remembrance of him of who he is to us in our lives. But the remembering is about relationship. It's not about what I know. Just like the apostles could stand in their confusion about this teaching and say, you know what? When the hard teachings show up, we know you. And we trust you to reveal all things to us. Now, when he finally ordains communion at his last supper, He's also going to include his suffering and his death in the remembering. He's going to include his resurrection in the remembering. But it starts with remembering that we are in him, apprenticed to him, and following him. That's what the 12 said here. And Peter and the 12 stayed, not because they knew what he was teaching, but because they knew the one who was teaching. 
That's why they stayed. You will stay in the confusion and the difficulty of hard teachings if you know the one who's teaching it. But if you think that your connection to Jesus is rooted in the clarity of your understanding of his hard teachings and you can't find it, there's a good chance you're gonna walk away. It's knowledge of the one who's teaching that keeps us there. Jesus wants us to stand in his hard teachings for the same reason that we know the one who is teaching. That's what Peter responded with on behalf of the 12. When Jesus said, do you guys wanna go too? Peter said, no, why why are we gonna go anywhere? We know you. We know you. We know you in a deep, intimate way. And we trust you. And we believe that you are from God, which means I don't need to know everything. Think about what that would do for a church where if our relationship with Jesus, our heart space connection to Jesus actually became more important than our head knowledge. (gasps) Can churches survive like that? Can a church survive where it is saying my relationship and connection with Jesus is more important than my doctrine and theology? (sighs) It's getting scary now, isn't it? Because here's why I think it matters. When we encounter the hard teachings, It's our relationship with Jesus that brings us clarity on the doctrine and theology of the hard teaching. We have to know the person before we can know his teaching. Sometimes we get that a little out of whack. Sometimes we want to focus on what's in here and it never gets filtered through who's in here. We need him here to filter what's in here. That's what's happening here for the the apostles in this teaching. They know the one who's teaching. And so that all brings us to Luke 22 in verse 19 and 20 and the connection between this hard teaching in John 6 and the institution of communion. It says this in verses 19 and 20. And he took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten saying, this is the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. His body given for us, his blood poured out for us. What he tried to teach them in John 6 with words, he's now teaching them with actions in the context of his crucifixion. The context of this teaching now has shifted from a feeding, miraculous feeding of 5,000 people from a history lesson about the Jews in the wilderness to what's about to come his crucifixion. And the context is now about his willing death for the redemption of the world. And he's now moving it to a practical act that all who believe in him are invited to actively participate in. In the eating of the bread and drinking of the juice in remembrance of him. What we call communion. Which is a meal that we partake of because we are abiding in him and he is abiding in us. Just as he said in his hard teaching that caused so many of his followers to respond with, say what? When he said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's where he makes his flesh and blood a meal that he invites us into participating in because we belong to him because our identity is in him, because we're being shaped by him, and we are becoming like him. See, the meal doesn't do these things in us, but rather, because he is doing these things in us through abiding in us, we remember all this by participating in the meal of communion, a meal that is about being in union with Jesus and remembering what he did to bring us into that union with him. Now this brings me to to five important aspects I want to just kind of go through very quickly that, that are tied to communion that we need to be aware of in the ordinance of communion if we are going to rightly take communion. And so the first one is the one who instituted the meal and the work he is doing in us through this meal. Jesus is the one who instituted this. 
Luke 22. It wasn't the apostle's idea. It wasn't something he had to do to satisfy the law of Moses. No, he took a meal that was in the historical context of the Jewish people and said, let me help you see the fuller meaning in it. This meal has always pointed to me. And here we are. I am in it and always have been. And he's doing that so that he can say, you belong to me. You are identified with me. I am shaping you with my abiding presence and you will become like me. Those are important aspects, mostly found in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. And I encourage you to read those two chapters as a way of understanding and, and getting more comfortable with what the communion meal is and how we can go about it in a worthy manner. But the first aspect we have to understand about communion is that, that it was ordained by Jesus. We saw that in Luke 22. And it should be our heart's desire to participate in it with reverence for Jesus. And the next, next aspect we need to see about communion is that it's for his church. It's fairly straightforward and simple. We see that in several places in 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul tells us that it's to be observed when the church is gathered together. He says that over and over again in 1 Corinthians 11. So it's for the church. It's for community. It's not something that we should do in isolation or when we're just seeking a meal to satisfy our hunger. Because remember, this meal is about the spiritual life. It's about Zoe. It's not about the physical life. I can remember as a kid taking communion and, and having this expectation that, like, because we always had breakfast after church on Sunday. So I was always hungry when we got to church. I can remember being, by the time we got to communion, being so hungry that I was like, God, let this just be like a miracle little wafer of bread that satisfies me. And it never did, but it was never meant to. <laughs> We have to have that in mind when we take communion. This is not about our physical life. This is about our spiritual life. Which brings us to the next aspect of communion that we gotta respect, which is that this meal actually nourishes the soul. We're people who have placed our faith in Jesus and we gather around the table with the understanding that the only thing that can sustain the internal life in us through Christ is the body of Christ himself. That's what he was saying in John 6. He was removing the veil slightly so that they could get a picture of what's coming. Listen to what John Piper writes about this. The table is not only a symbolic rite that we do, but it does something to us as we eat and drink in faith. And so another aspect of the Lord's Supper that we have to be aware of and we have to respect is in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we do this to remember the one we know who teaches us all things for sure, but by participating in communion, we are remembering him as the one who died for us and the one who is returning for us. We can't slip by that. It's a remembering of Jesus as the one who has redeemed our past and is the only promise and hope for our future. That's what we remember in communion. And finally, we see that communion is a time of self-examination. In short, it's a reminder to look at our lives and consider the extent to which we are living out of belonging to him, being identified in him, being shaped by him, and becoming like him. It's an opportunity to look at our lives and say, are these the things that are happening in my life right now? It's an occasion to examine ourselves and ask, am I living out of the spiritual life of Christ in me, that Zoe life, or am I living more out of that physical life, the bios life, the life of the flesh? It only serves me. That's what the self-examination of communion time looks like. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on them himself. It's time 
when we step into the moment of communion, it's time to put our truest heart's desires before Jesus and let him refine them. To put our thoughts and our will before Jesus and let him redeem them. In short, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, it is our time to sit before Jesus and seek his correction and his discipline. It's our time to have that regular meeting with him that says, Lord, show me where you need to correct me. Teach me to step into that. In doing that, he moves us further from the life of the flesh and deeper into the life of the spirit, that Zoe life. The hard teachings of Jesus Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That is a hard teaching. It was hard for his first century hearers. It's hard for us. But when we see it in its immediate and historical context, we begin to understand it's about God's plan of salvation for the world. His plan that was begun with the Hebrews and Abraham and carried forward through the same people being led out of Egypt by Moses and nourished with bread from heaven to keep them alive in the wilderness as a picture, a precursor of the spiritual reality that Jesus is the bread of life for our souls that would come later, which Jesus himself now brings forward through the institution of communion with his apostles at the Last Supper, he brings it forward to his church, to all of his followers, which carries into our day this moment here where his body, those who believe in him, who remember through the same ordinance when we gather together and take the bread and the juice, remembering his sacrifice for us for sure, but also remembering the relationship we have with him through his grace and his word that keeps us in him, belonging to him, finding our identity in him, being shaped by him and becoming like him. So I'm going to invite Allison to come back up and he's just going to play some music as we prepare to take communion together right now. And with all this in mind, I want to encourage you to have an experience of the one you know and love in this moment. And so in, an, in a worthy manner, with hearts that can say with Peter, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life examining those hearts before Christ around the table of communion and allowing him to correct us in all the ways that we're preoccupied with the flesh instead of the Zoe spiritual life. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to prepare to take these elements now. If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus yet, feel free to pass and just observe with the understanding that we, as apprentices of Jesus, are professing our faith again in this moment. We wouldn't want you to feel compelled to express something you don't believe. So don't feel any pressure in the moment of those around you, perhaps, taking these elements. And as we prepare to take them together, let's just spend some time right now opening our hearts to Jesus. as we take this bread acknowledge that your body was broken for us that by your sacrifice we have life in you reminding us that we abide in you and you abide in us through this act of taking this bread <clears throat> 
Lord, we just ask that you open our hearts and our minds to you, the one we know. Remind us not only of what you've done to redeem our past, but the hope of your return that gives our future a promise. And so we take this bread now with that in mind. take this juice now together as a reminder of your blood poured out for us, cleansing us by putting the very life of yourself in us. Letting us stand before God in your holiness, in your righteousness. And so, Father, correct us. Make us into the image of your Son so that we may live as he lives and find the truest blessing, the greatest blessing, of living in your kingdom as yours. And that's possible because of the cleansing power of this blood that we remember now with this juice. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to come together as a family, as your church, and to take these elements together and to remember what it is you've done for us, what it is you're doing for us. To remember the one who we are becoming like, the one who is shaping us, the one who is freeing us from all that is not of you. And Lord, we ask that we live in the spiritual life, that Zoe life, and that this meal nourishes our souls and that we find correction in this time and that we draw closer to you and that we remember with zeal what your son has done for us and what he will do for us in the future. So this moment is yours, God, doing us what you will through this time of communion. And we're thankful that we can come to you through this in the name of Jesus. Amen.